In this lesson, we'll learn how we can start to apply realistic volume lighting to our Cinema 4D scenes. Okay, so we have this alleyway, and what I'd like to do is uh, use some volumetric light to give sort of this uh, creepy sort of rays of light that are creeping up sort of through this little storm drain here. So when it comes to applying any sort of volumetric effect, we can do this on our Cinema 4D light sources. Now we can apply this type of an effect on something like an Omni light. Uh, we can do this with a spotlight, and we can do this with an IES light. Some of these other light types that we have here, they're really not compatible with the volume lighting that we're going to look at. So in my case, I'm going to start with something like a spotlight, since we really don't need uh, the volume effect to be contained in anything other than just a small little area here. So what I'll do is take my spotlight, now that that's been created, and I'll try to sort of place this underneath this little drain here. Okay, now just for the sake of demonstration, if I come in and select my visible light, uh, right now it is set to none, but what we could do is set this to something like visible, and if I come in and press Alt-R on my keyboard, with this light set to visible, now we can actually see sort of this cone of light from our spotlight, and the, the size and shape of this cone is going to allow, or it's going to follow the uh, shape that we define here, so if we really, really spread that out, we get this really, really spread out cone of light. If we take our cone and really focus that down, our light appears the same way. Now this uh, very, very simple visible light, uh, it's not going to obey any sort of shadows that we may set up. So if I come in and let's say open this up a little bit wider so that's a little bit easier to see. And then if I go back and let's say give it some basic ray trace shadows, you'll notice that we don't see any sort of rays of light or any sort of shadows on here because uh, this visible light really doesn't support that. This is going to be really, really s simple uh, fog for our light. If we want something that actually looks more realistic and starts to have these broken up little rays of light, which we should start to see here, what we would use in that sort of a situation is instead of visible, we would set that to volumetric. And now we can actually see the effect of those rays as that light is being broken by certain objects in the scene. Again, that is assuming that you do have shadows turned on for your light source. Now we also have inverse volumetric, which may be sort of interesting artistically, but is definitely not the way that things would behave in real life. What this will do is essentially reverse the effect that we have here. So instead of these uh, little rays here being uh, sort of treated as shadows, uh, if we set it to inverse volumetric, what we should see is where those areas of shadow normally appear, that is now where the uh, volumetric effect starts to appear. So it's really sort of reversing that volumetric effect. Again, not very realistic, so if you're going for realism, the volumetric effect or the volumetric option is what you would want to choose. Okay, now let's come in and start to adjust our light so that way our light is able to sort of fill up this entire area. What we could also do is maybe take our light source and pull that maybe just a little bit further down. There we go. And I'll just sort of move this over to the side, just making sure that we do have this cone of light that is uh, essentially covering up the entire storm drain. So if I pull back from the side, you can see that we do have this cone of light and this storm drain right here, and that uh, storm drain falls comfortably well within inside that little cone of light. Okay, very nice. Now, we have these shadows that are starting to appear, but they're really, really rough. Um, so what we need to do is if we take a look down inside here, uh, we have uh, some options that are going to be uh, very heavily responsible for our uh, volumetric light source. It's going to be found in uh, the details. We also have the visibility here as well. So if we go into the visibility, um, what we need to do is, first off, if we want to start to fix up some of these sort of broken, uh, jaggy shadows here inside the visibility for our light, we're going to take a look at the sample distance. So that has to do with, again, sort of the uh, sampling that's happening inside of this volume. And right now, it's set to 25 centimeters, which is fairly low in my case. So I'll probably want to set this down, uh, just for the sake of demonstration, if we take that maybe down to 10 centimeters, you can see right away that starts to really clear up a lot of the noise that we have in here. Now if we come in and maybe take that down a little bit further to one or two centimeters, we should see that that noise clears up even a little bit more. So my recommendation would be to come in here and 
uh, start to drop that down and try to get as high a value as you can while still maintaining some relatively decent shadowing effects. That'll help your renders move along a little bit faster um, and help you from really, really bogging down your renders with settings that may be a little bit higher quality than what you need. So the smaller the value here, the uh, more detailed your shadows are going to become as far as the volumetrics are concerned, but also the slower your renders will be at that point. Now if I come in and if I were to, let's say, pull my camera back, what we should see is that this volumetric effect, it extends up to pretty much where we have our uh, cone of light coming to a stop. Now that may be good for some situations. We could come back in here and uh, try to start to adjust this fall off a little bit more. So what we could do is uh, go into our details and right now we have our fall off set to none, but if we wanted to set this to maybe an inverse square, what we should see is if we come in here and start to um, make some alterations to that, you can see that our volumetric effect really doesn't uh, fully match up the, thing, the uh, settings and things that we may have set up in our light source itself. So even though we've changed the fall off, there's really no change in our volumetric effect and if we start to drop down the intensity of our light we can start to see a little bit of an effect now at this point so keep in mind that there are certain attributes that will directly affect our volume and there are other attributes that maybe don't have such a dramatic effect um, one of the things that we can start to do if we wanted to let's say change the color of our volume we should be able to change the color of our light source itself and that will start to influence the color of this light volume what we could also do is if we wanted to define our own custom color, we could come in and enable a gradient. Now this is actually based on distance. So if we come in here and let's maybe, let's say we keep that at white. And for this end, we'll maybe give that a little bit more of a green. Now at that point, we can start to see where uh, our light sort of toward the beginning part of our light source starts off sort of white and then we start to taper up into more of this green color as we start to see here. Okay, now here we can start to change our inner and outer distance. So this is sort of where our uh, light fog will begin, or in this case it's rather where the light fog will end. So our outer distance, you can see as we start to adjust that, we have sort of this little cap that we see on our spotlight. And At that point you can see that's where our light starts to pretty much disappear as far as the uh, volume is concerned. We can also start to take maybe our outer distance. This is where our light will start to lose its intensity. Maybe we don't want it to start losing anything until this point, so we can take our inner distance and start to bring that up. And now we can see, again, if we take a look at our gradient, where we have sort of this nice white, and then we transition up into a little bit more of this green. So lots and lots of control that we have here. It does take a little bit of getting used to as far as uh, the controls themselves and sort of how they work. But this uh, definitely becomes a very, very powerful thing to have. We could also start to uh, come in here. If we wanted to maybe add some uh, dust and other things like that, right now this is very, very even and very uniform. It really doesn't look like what we would expect to see in real life, where typically you're going to have wind, uh, you're going to have uh, air turbulence and things like that that are going to make this a little bit more irregular. So what we can do is start to introduce some noise into this. With our noise, we could set uh, whether or not this noise is going to be seen in the illumination or whether it's going to be seen in the visibility. If we set it to the illumination, um, if we had an object that was set up here, we should actually see sort of a noise pattern uh, start to appear in the object itself. We might be able to demonstrate this very quickly. If we pull that up, where we should actually see some of the noise in the uh, illumination that's coming from this light we can see sort of that little cloudy effect there. Now, in my case, instead of the noise coming and being visible in the illumination, what we want is the noise to be visible in the visibility, which is essentially the uh, light cone itself. So now at this point, we can come in here and start to uh, kind of play with our uh, different noise types. So be a little bit more of a wavy turbulence in there, which gives us a little bit more of a wavy appearance here at this point uh, starts to become just sort of a, a matter of playing around with some of these different attributes and finding sort of the uh, value that is going to work for you. 
So this can definitely take a little bit of exploration and a little bit of playing around, but at this point now you can start to see that we have a little bit more of a broken up appearance to this. If we go back to our light source itself, if we go back to the visibility, maybe we can start to increase that brightness a little bit more, start to make that light cone a little bit more prevalent. There we go. I'll just go ahead and get rid of this plane since we really don't need that right now. There we go, and now we can start to see something that looks a little bit more like a smoke or some kind of a fog that's rolling out of that storm drain. Okay, very nice. Now, maybe if we wanted to finish this out, we could uh, sort of use some of the features that we looked at in our previous lesson with uh, object glows and things like that. So, let's come in here and drop in another plane. I probably should have just kept the one that I had in there before, but that's okay. We can just use this one. So what I'll do is take this plane and sort of position it just below this area. And what I might do is come in and take a material. I'll just right click and apply it to that plane. Can take my material and let's disable its color and its specular. And instead just give it a nice bright luminance. Okay, and then I'll also give that a little bit of glow. So now if I press Alt-R on my keyboard, we can see the glow that is coming from that. We have full control over the uh, glow attributes. In my case, I'll probably leave this uh, pretty much as it is. I, I uh, really kind of like how that looks. So we have some glow that's coming through here. But at this point, you can see where this plane is now blocking out all of the illumination from my spotlight. So I can just go into my plane, and we'll take advantage of the compositing tag that we looked at in one of our earlier lessons. So I'll drop a compositing tag onto this plane. Let's go to the tag and I will disable this plane's ability to cast any shadows which should now allow this volume light and the other illumination to just pass right through that plane as if it's no longer there. And so now we start to get kind of this nice little glowing effect coming from underneath. There we go. Maybe start to take that strength and maybe bring that down just a little bit because it does feel a little bit strong. But now I can go back to my plane, maybe take my brightness up a little bit for this light if I want to get its volume lighting looking just a little bit stronger. There we go. That's starting to look a little bit better. Now I may need to go back and uh, take this glow, maybe bring that down because at this point it does start to look a little bit strong. But this is really just sort of the, the process, just coming in here and playing and uh, adjusting these values until everything is looking sort of the way that you want. Okay, so if I come in and maybe render this into my picture viewer, Shift R, there we go. So now we have these uh, nice volumetric effects that are coming from this light, a little bit of smoke, a little bit of fog, a little bit of glow. In my case, we can still see some artifacts in the shadows themselves, so as we talked about, what we'll probably need to do is go into the light itself and start to take my sample distance, maybe down a little bit lower, something like 2 centimeters. There we go. So you can definitely see my renders taking a little bit longer now, but my shadows are much, much cleaner compared to what I had before. So if I zoom in a little bit tighter, you can really see sort of along these edges here where we have our shadowing effects, lots of little artifacts and things like that. But now by taking that sample distance down, we've really managed to clean that up but at the cost of some render time where this was a one second render, now we're at about a five second render. Okay, so that's a look at how we can start to apply these realistic volume effects to our Cinema 4D light sources. And that's also going to bring us to the end of our Introduction to Lighting in Cinema 4D course. So over these last uh, couple of hours, we've had a chance to talk about a lot of things from uh, the different types of lights in Cinema 4D, how they differ from each other, uh, working with shadows, with ambient occlusion, different uh, IES lights, global illumination, and lots and lots of other things that you're going to find really, really important as you start to get a little bit deeper into Cinema 4D and start to work on your own lighting and rendering scenarios. So I hope you had fun watching this course. I had a lot of fun putting this together. Be sure to check out all of the additional Cinema 4D training available at Digital Tutors, and we'll see you next time.